Sean Phillips, yes. welcome back to South Africa. Thank you very much. Your third visit now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right, we, we can't keep you awake, are we? Yes. Well, no, I, I mean, it was 1983. I went to Peter Robinson's house, and I was having dinner, and there were some folks from, from, uh, from South Africa who were there. I mean, and he just introduced, oh, this is Sean. You know, and remember, this is 1983. And as we're sitting at the dinner table, Pete and I start talking about some of the recording we've done. And suddenly these people clicked that this is the guy that did second contribution, you know. <laughs> and since that time, I've been trying to get back here. And I finally made it back in 94. And I made it back once, did that short tour where we only did a few shows, did another one. And now I'm back again. Right. Well, I'm glad you've been here before, because then you won't think I'm a liar when I tell you that we occasionally have sunshine in this country. Understood. <laughs> no, no, I know that. Yeah, but I'm glad if it was sunshine, it would be real hot. It would be just yeah. like Texas. Mm. You know, I want to see something different, man. <laughs> Is that where you're from? From Texas? Yes, I was right. born in Fort Worth, Texas, okay. but I now... I reside, I currently reside in Austin, Texas. Uh -huh. Not actually in the city. I'm 27 miles outside of Austin to the west. But this is after a bit of globetrotting as well yeah. because you lived oh, in London a for a while. You lived oh, in Italy. Italy, London. I lived all over the place with my dad who was a, an author. And um, I think that's pretty much what um, set me up to one of the reasons I make music the way I mu make music because I was so young that I was not involved in the politics or the foibles of human nature. And, uh, I mean, at a very young age, I suddenly realized one planet, one species. And that's all there is to it, you know. And um, so that's kind of what I try to put into the music. Great. And uh, as far as the music goes, um, it's not everyone's cup of tea, admittedly. No. Um, and it's, it's a very distinctive Sean Phillips style. Yes. Where, where does that come from? What, what are the interviews? I haven't the faintest influences. idea. I, <laughs> I go only where my consciousness drives me, where my heart and my, my mind and my, uh, my soul drive me. That's where the music takes me. If it turns out country, then it's country, you know? I mean, lately, uh, I've got a new song I've just written. It says, I've got a knob on the steering wheel and an automatic pilot. I got a sleeper in the back and a couple nickels in my pocket. I'm headed toward a thunderstorm. I'm in a little pain. There's going to be two of us driving, just me in that rain. But, Lord, I'm getting tired of hauling these loads. And, yes, I'm getting tired of seeing these roads. One of these days, I'm going to have a little sit because I'm flat out getting too old for this. Yeah, yeah you got it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of where my consciousness is leading me today, you know. I, I could relate to that. Idea. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> But your very first album, if I recall, is called I'm Alone in 1965. That's that correct. Your first solo album. That's correct. I, was, I went to England. I was on my way to India to study sitar. Yeah. And I was waylaid at a party by a gentleman named Dennis Preston. And Dennis heard me playing and said, would you like to make an album? And I said, yes, as long as you don't put a time clause on the contract. In other words, I can come and go as I please. And uh, so we ended up making two albums with Dennis. Now, you also played with bands like Blossom Toes, and you played with sure. Donovan for a short while. And sure. So, um, so how long did you sp spend in England? How many years? Uh, from about 1963 to 67. Mm -hmm. And at 67 was when I moved to Italy. And I only moved out because the English said, get out. Yeah. You know, you're taking work away from a British subject. That making too and much said, money, yeah. Yeah, right. I, I said, what's his name? And they said, get out. <laughs> it must have been a lovely time to, to spend in England, though. Because yes, it was. Because the whole sort of Carnaby Street, um, yes. the Beatles, um, everything exactly. happening at that time. Exactly. In fact, um, I believe um, you were very influential as far as the Beatles' um, sitar sound and, and that. Way, well, so. I taught George his first, his first basic techniques with the instrument. Because I had seen Ravi Shankar several years before in Toronto. And that's what got me started. He was kind enough to sit with me for three hours after his concert and show me the basics. And then I went and got one on my own and just continued to go from there. And uh, when I got over to England and got acquainted with Don and all those folks, then uh, I had, uh, I don't know, I must have given six or seven lessons 
You know, it's a, all rather vague these days. <laughs> 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 if you understand my confused. meaning, yeah, there, that's yes. what Keith Richards says, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Doesn't it. remember 1967. <laughs> that's it. That's it. You also had a short stint with uh, Wanda K. Frog or Blue Weaver, as you were yes, saying. Yes, Mick player. Weaver. Now I saw Mick Weaver not that all that long ago, seven years ago, and he looked amazing. Yeah. I mean, he'd been working out, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mick Weaver was, was real good. Yeah, he had a bit of a strange name, the Winder K. Frog. Winder yeah. K. Frog. I, I never did ask him where he came up yeah. with that. You know? <laughs> it's sort of name you'd be scared to ask about. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Getting back to South Africa, um, you played the uh, Southern Cross concerts yes. uh, last weekend. Yes. How, how did that go down? It was very r relaxed atmosphere, very nice. It had just a little teeny bit of rain, but otherwise uh, the festival went very well. Although I tend... Unless I can do my full show, I do tend to get a little confused because my full, full show is two hours and ten minutes. And when I have to break it up into 50 minutes, I don't know what to put where, you know. And uh, it, it gets very confusing for me because I have a, a set way that I go through the show, not only for the... Um, um, how do I want to put this? The entertainment value of the songs, the way they run, a fast song, slow song, so, so forth and so on. Uh, but also because of the energy level uh, right, that yeah. I need because I have to build to a certain point. In other words, uh, I couldn't sit down and just start right out and play Casey Dice. Yeah. There's no way I could do that. I have to warm up to that, you know, and... Uh, I ain't this 23-year-old spring chicken I once was, you know, <laughs> so I have to be kind of careful. And I like to warm up, and I don't really get the chance to do that at festivals, you know. So you prefer doing a, a sit-down concert type Oh, yes, thing oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, because, one, you have much more control of the situation. You can create an atmosphere, which is my point. I like to create an atmosphere. And uh, because... Uh, a concert can't just be you get up there, you start it up and rail away at the same volume level for an hour and a half, you know. It, there has to be dynamics in it. I wish you know, someone would tell a few absolutely. bands that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you look at the music business today and it's like not far removed from the acute ward of a major mental institution somewhere, <laughs> you know. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> Well, I can certainly vouch for the fact that uh, Sean Phillips does create an atmosphere. The, the last time I saw him, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. No, Everyone no. was howling their, their yep. eyes out, yep. which, which is astounding. I mean, I've, I've seen artists make a few people cry, but I've never seen an entire audience <laughs> yeah, with tears streaming down their faces. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> and a, a very much a, a cross sort of um, audience. You, you've got youngsters, mm. you, you've got grandparents. Um, it's almost a family outing, a, a lot of the, the people at your... I do not know what to attribute that to. I know the only thing I can put it down to is the music itself. Because the fact of the matter is is that I have always sold more records in non-English speaking countries than I have in English speaking countries. Mm. My own country, for instance. And it, it has to do, it has to do with the emotional impact that the motion, the music itself makes. And then I found out that Peter, people later go back and deliberately translate the lyrics so they can put the lyric with the music. And uh, it, it, comes, it also comes in the writing. A, lo a lot of the songs are written, music and words, simultaneously. And uh, you get the, uh, uh, that's rare. I will, I will admit that, mm -hmm. though that is rare. Uh, but things like All the Kings and Castles, Moments, uh, those were both words and music simultaneously. And I have a new song called The Man, uh, which is, uh, unfortunately, I can't play here because I promised that I would not do any sequences this tour. Uh, okay. Besides, I got fed up with doing sequences. I mean, I've been doing it for, I was doing it for five or six years, and I really got fed up with, you better be on top of it when you push play. <laughs> 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 Because it ain't going to stop and go back and wait for you, you know. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. When I saw you at the Melody Theatre a couple of years back, you were really keen to experiment with different styles. Yes. Is that, are you still doing that nowadays? Oh, very much so. Very much so. Although the, the, the uh, I have a gentleman playing with me, a man named Van Wilkes, yeah. who is... 
for guitarists famous all over the world. They've read about him everywhere. Mm -hmm. But he's been under the thumb of Bill Ham, ZZ Top's manager, mm -hmm. management for a long, long time. So he doesn't really get to get out like he should. Um, but anyway, Van has come with me. And uh, the show is going to be, apart from the atmosphere that I create with the synthesizers that I trigger in real time, no sequences, mm -hmm. okay? I, I have a MIDI guitar, and I, I use the computer to trigger the synthesizer so I can have strings behind, say, a couple of the things, or brass mm -hmm. or something else. Uh, the show will be completely acoustic. Uh, that's all he brought. Right. Van just brought an acoustic guitar, which is a miracle in himself because it took him 10 years to put the electric down. I mean, he just wouldn't do it. And then finally, like 10 years ago, I started going to Austin and, and playing concerts. Hey, come on, man, bring your acoustic in. Oh, you know, he was really insecure with just an acoustic. And now he goes out and does acoustic concerts by himself. You know, So I got him started on that. I'm really happy about that. A lot of your arrangements um, are pretty complicated. Uh, yes. You've got strings and brass and that type mm -hmm. of thing. What's always fascinated me with um, composers is, do you hear all of that in your head before you start, or do you kind of make it up as you go as along? You Some of it you hear. Uh, it's it's part of the, the creation of the piece itself. Some of it will lend a hand to the creation of the melody itself. But for the most part, after you've gotten the basic structure of the chords and how the lyrics are going to flow through the, that set of chords, uh, then you start to hear it. Once you've recorded it and put it down, you're listening to it back. Then you're not involved with the basic structure any longer, and you're, you're free to elaborate, <laughs> which is exactly what any classical composer does. I mean, they just take a folk melody and elaborate on it. Yeah, I mean, that's what any of those guys did. Wagner, Mozart, here, Wild, here, Mozart, here, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They just elaborate on that, which is what I do. But the basic structure is the the uh, uh, the hard part because the most difficult thing for any composer to do is to try and create a unique melody that no one has ever mm. heard almost impossible today but um, um, you know you just you just keep on going and hope that nobody's ever heard it before <laughs> that was actually going to be my next question right now there's a tremendous amount of manipulation that's going on in the music business especially in the United States I mean, they take kids that shouldn't be out of their garages for at least another 10 years, you know, and they throw them up there in front of the public. They lay all kinds of money on the radio people, you know, play these guys, put this on rotation. If, you, if it sells a lot, then your radio station will make some money, you know. That's not payola anymore. That's yeah. business because that record is their advertisement. That's the way they work it in the U.S. So you get these people who really haven't had the chance to fully develop their craft, and they're already enormous stars. Mm. And if they're young enough, they no way they know how to handle it. Three you albums know. down the line, they Three fall albums. apart, yeah. or fall the record apart. company dumps them. Exactly. Yeah. And because of that, they don't get the chance to develop, you know. Yeah, it, it's got bigger than the music these days, yes. hasn't it? Uh, exactly. With MTV and uh, the, the, just the whole hype of merchandising and everything yeah, else. Exactly. It's, it's enormous, and the music really uh, plays a minor part of it. Exactly, and I really don't want anything to do with it, which is why I'm doing my other job now, which is uh, I'm a professional firefighter and emergency medical tech in Texas. Oh, right. And um, the gratification is the same. It actually, it actually may be more. I mean, you know, I... I got the same gratification from an 86-year-old female who had a, a fractured pelvis, and I took really good care of her, you know, when uh, we took her to the ER. And uh, when I started to go away, she grabbed me by the arm with a really good grip and, and said, you know, thank you so much for taking care of me. And like the double standing ovation that I got at the Isle of Wight from 650,000 people just like went out the window, man. You know, <laughs> it's a different kind of direct gratification. But the, the deal is, is that I like to help people in moments when they can't help themselves. 
That's that's the point. Otherwise, I can leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that? Um, have you any ideas of how you're going to go down in South Africa now? This uh, have you had any um, sort of feedback? I haven't got Is the faintest idea. Uh, we should do well as yeah. far as uh, 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 people coming to the gigs yeah. and so forth because I know they really liked what they heard last time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for you folks that are listening out there, uh, what you will hear is exactly the same voice that you heard in 1970. Uh, or 1965. Or 1965 or yeah. any of those because it is the one thing I have not messed with. I have never abused the voice. In other words, I have never sung with my voice dehydrated. Yeah. And because that's the that's the important point. The, if you're going to continue to sing all your life, the voice must remain moist. You know, drink water. Yeah. You know, don't drink beer. Beer dehydrates you, man. Blow your voice out real quick. But, and are there any standout artists that you like nowadays? Anybody? Oh, I like Alanis Morissette. She's writing some nice things. Uh, Tori Amos writes her thing. Um, but I have to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm in a situation here that's kind of unprecedented. Um, I'm going to make another album mm -hmm. within the next eight months. Uh, the reason I'm going to make another album is because, one... I really felt bad about the album The Truth If It Kills. The guy did not follow my vision at all. He would not listen to me. And so I want to re-record that entire thing. And I had always felt that, but I thought I'd never get the chance. But then my manager, Arlo, went on the Internet and asked my fans, what do you want? from Sean. Do you want a CD of the live BBC recordings from the 60s or whatever? And they, almost to a person, they came back and said, no, we want a new album. So Arlo said, okay, you pay for it. And they did. They have bought me a hard disk, a master hard disk recording system, and they're paying the salaries of Paul Buckmaster and Pete Robinson in California. And uh, so I'm borrowing the uh, Neumann microphones here from uh, <laughs> from Willie Nelson because yeah. his studio is a quarter of a mile from my house, and Willie's already agreed to loan me the mics. So I have the mics to do master vocals and master guitars in my house. I'll then transfer them to an ADAT 8-track and send that out to California and let Pete and Paul do whatever they want with it, and then later I'll go out because there's a couple of tunes... There's one tune called The Power of a Woman, which is, a, uh, I want a jazz feel, and the only way I'm going to get it is to play live with other musicians. Uh, so I'm going to send that stuff out there, and then we'll get all the musicians together and we'll play live, and uh, which is what I didn't get to do on The Truth If It Kills, which is why you couldn't, nobody liked the album. That's, that's, the, uh, that's what I wanted to get back to about writing something. When we were writing something... The, one of the secrets to my music and the recordings is the fact that I bring in the best guys I can find, Alfonso Johnson on bass, Thanks. people like this. Bring them in there. Hey, Al, here's the tune. There's the basic structure. That's my vision. Now put your vision on top of that. And that's the way I've always done it. I never told a single musician what to play other than what I want to hear in an arrangement. You know, so that's that's the way it works. Well, dealing with guys like Pete Robinson, if I remember him, he's a British musician going back to the early 70s, isn't he? Oh, he's absolutely. Uh, but if you see a Jackie Chan film yeah. or yeah, an Eddie Murphy film, v Vampire in Brooklyn, if you see music by J. Peter Robinson, yeah. that's Pete. You know? Are you kidding? He's making $300,000 a film, man, every time he does a Jackie Chan film. <laughs> and Paul Buckmoss, he was a great arranger, wasn't he? He's a great arranger. Uh, the last thing Paul did was um, 12 Monkeys. He did 12 Monkeys. But, see, Pete schmoozes and Paul doesn't. So Pete gets a lot more movies. <laughs> you, know, like, you know the game, man. So, uh, but uh, another thing that's going to be unique about the CD is because of what they both do, if you have THX six-channel Dolby stereo capability in your house, that's the way you'll hear this record because that's the way we're going to record it. Mm -hmm. And it'll be quite fun. It's going to be movie music. And uh, uh, because it's going to kind of be my shall we say, last hurrah in CDs. Um, 
it's going to be a sonic adventure. It's going to start, and you'll hear song, classical piece, song, song, linked with another classical piece, but it will go all the way through, just like Second Contribution, like nonstop. Conceptual, conceptual mm. album. Exactly. And um, so I'm really looking forward mm. to it because a lot of the, a lot of the classical pieces uh, I've only heard with my computer playing it from triggering my synthesizers, and I really want to hear them with live players. You know, that's going to be fun, man. Well, I've got to tell you that in the mid '70s, we used to play one of your tracks in the discos. Do you wonder? Sure, it was a gr- it, was it was a big a disco album, hit actually. in New York as well. Yeah, and as you see there, A and M never picked up on that. Yeah. You know, they dropped the ball. They just continuously dropped the ball uh, all during the career. When's it going to come out on CD, Sean? Do you wonder? Yeah. It's out. I wonder. Where? It's out now oh. on the Internet. Okay. Wounded Bird Records. It's, it's a, not you, can, you can find yeah. almost everything except Rumpled Stillskin's Resolve and uh, Spaced, I think, are the only two that you can't get yet. And that's only because... <laughs> Polygram bought A&M. <laughs> Universal bought Polygram. And for two years, we couldn't figure out who had the keys to the vault. <laughs> you know, finally, we discovered it was Interscope Records. <laughs> you know, oh, great. Okay, now you tell us. <laughs> meanwhile, I've got lifetimes of work in that yeah. vault, you know. What I'm doing is I'm working with David Marks. And any profit that... Uh, is beyond my guarantee for me coming here is going to go to the uh to david marks the hidden years right thing and uh <clears throat> it's well kind of the reason for that is um it's a kind of a backlash against the system as it were okay you're not going to tell people who these people are we will uh, that, that's kind of the way it works. It was, it's always the way I've done it. If I were recording in a studio and I had a main engineer who did the, the, the stuff and there was a second engineer, I would kind of like keep an eye on the second engineer. And if I saw that he, I thought he knew what he was doing and he looked like he was competent and wanted to come up in the world, as it were, the next time I went in and make an album, I made him the main engineer. And this guy could go work with somebody else. And then, you know, and you just keep that stepping up all the time. Keep the ball rolling. Yeah, Yeah, keep the ball rolling. Exactly. And um, so I I just kind of want to do that with the the musicians as well. Hi, this is Sean Phillips, and this is this week's Dino Quiz question. Uh, And if you answer this question correctly, you will get a CD of uh, the compilation Another Contribution from Me. And the question is... What is it that I do when I'm not making music? 